Hey, it's Jose Galison. You're watching No Way Jose. You can find me on No Way Jose YouTube channel, all the major audio podcatchers, and Odyssey as well. Uh, I don't have so much info information on the intro. I forget who that's from. I think Richard, when I bring him in in a second, will uh, he knows where it's from. So I hope he'll give a little bit of plugs for whoever that was. Uh, yeah, uh, my guest today, as I just mentioned, Richard Booth. Uh, just for the rundown, it's the 26th right now. If you're watching on the 26th, you're watching the live stream. If not, you're going to get it roughly about a week or so later, depending on how the schedule works out. Uh, I think right now it is going to be a week. Uh, if you want to be able to have access to it in the meantime, you need to be a patron at patreon.com slash no way Jose, uh, 2020. Um, I think I just said that wrong. No, I was right. I, I had a brain, brain fire there. But yeah, the lowest level is two bucks. High, highest level is twenty. The twenty dollar is the sponsors, and I'll read them off uh, every episode. I have C McRae of the Whiskey and Tea Podcast. Jeremy, you can follow him at Twitter at Jeremy Rhymes. He's an Etsy store as well at Etsy.com/shop/raisingliberty. And I have Mikel Thorpe of the Expat Money Show. Uh, he's a guy, if uh, you're looking to move out of the country or do, you know, it's finagle, some sort of stuff like that, he's your guy. He does it for a job, so you can hit him up. He actually does that. Like, you look up his content, you can find him and pay him to, to help you out with that. But he also has a show where he kind of goes into that as well. So maybe if you want to check out a show before you decide to pay for his services, what have you, or if you're interested in the topic, go check him out. Uh, yeah, today the topic, I mean, if you've been following along with my Richard Booth stuff, you know that we've been covering OKC, so we're going more of the OKC bombing. This is the fifth part. Uh, this episode we're probably going to cover John Doe 2, and then maybe squeeze in some more of the other characters. Uh, I do want to let you guys know, I just, episode 171, uh, so this was very recently, this was last week, I co- I had, uh, Duncan Lemp's widow, Casey Robinson, also the mother of his child. She was pregnant at the time when, uh, Duncan Lemp got, uh, essentially uh, no-knock raided and essentially just got killed. According to her, and I think she's the uh, the most reliable eyewitness, they legit just broke through the windows and essentially shot him. Uh, I mean, maybe he reached for a gun, maybe he didn't. Uh, either way, that's kind of irrelevant. Uh, you bust through someone's uh, house like that, uh, you're liable to get shot at. But yeah, go check that out. It was a good episode. I feel like I did everything I said to do. I wanted to humanize them, and I also wanted to get her side of the story, uh, which I did. Uh, I think that's the first time she's done it in that type of format. I believe it's been like mediated through lawyers and journalists and such before, but not in this type of format. So that's the only place you're going to be able to see it. And I don't think, uh, I talk, kind of talked behind the scenes, I don't think she's really interested in going to another platform. So I tried to see if she would be because I do want to try to get that story out. But, you know, obviously it's what she's comfortable with and I respect that. But so I'm just saying this may be the only place you get to see that. And uh, she did go into some stuff so far as the account. If you're someone who follows the story and you're wanting to be up to date on it, there was some stuff in there that I have not seen elsewhere. She cleared up some stuff that was kind of up in the air. So I do think uh, whether you want to get the uh, human story, say you want to share it to someone to be like show how awful it is, whatever. Or if you're just someone following the story, there's a there's a little bit of that for everyone. Um, yeah, we didn't really go too much in like political theory on it and stuff. So if that's the kind of thing you're wanting, because I know a lot of people go that route, Dungan Lamp. I have done that with Magnus Pin Video. On my YouTube channel, I actually have these both under a playlist for Duncan Lemp. So I have the one that's more like a broad type of, you know, political theory, what happened, to kind of go into the different, um, you know, multiple uh, changes in the story about the cops. Whereas with the Casey episode, you know, Duncan Lemp's, you know, his girlfriend, we uh, we kind of more covered, um, you know, who Duncan Lemp was, kind of get to know him as a person, got to know her. Her kid even popped in a couple times, Duncan Lemp's child as well. And, um you know, uh, he kind of popped in the, in the episode, a little two-year-old. He's a cute little guy. Uh, yeah, and then we also kind of covered her side of the story, so her account of the events. So I do think uh, you should go check that out, and I ask you to share it as well because, like I said, uh, I mean, my show's not huge, but I mean, it's not small either, but I want to try to get that out. So if, if, if you ever share anything in my content, share that one because uh, I do think it's important. I want to get that one out there. Uh, also, toplobster.com. You're supposed to check out, uh, get 10% off. Uh, yeah, he's got my merch. He's got a lot of other shows merch, and he's also got a lot of uh, his designs that aren't, aren't podcast related. A lot of good stuff. Uh, but all right, let's go ahead and get Richard in here, and let's get to it. Hey, what's up, man? Hey, Jose, how you doing? Good, good. Uh, you want to real quick uh, give uh, let let the people know because I know you know more about that uh, little little clip I played. Oh, by the way, I do want to let people know. Uh, I'm basically out. I've ran out of good little intros. Even that one's kind of a little more vague. It's obviously not completely on topic. It's more like broadly kind of fed shit you know bad stuff they do uh i mean so if there's anything okc related or anything like that you know feel free to share it to me or you know whether it be on facebook twitter or whatever uh, hit me up and because I'm, I'm looking for more intros otherwise we'll just start recycling i don't know how many episodes we're gonna do but yeah sorry go ahead let, let us know who that was and we'll 
That way we yeah. can give our due. <laughs> so, yeah, that legendary edit there was by Marina. It goes by Marina Oswald on Twitter. And it was a kind of a reply to the CIA employee, John Cipher. Uh, he's really just kind of an ass. And, you know, he posted on Twitter that, oh, the CIA hasn't really done anything bad for 50 years. And uh, her montage there, it just shows one thing after another from the last 50 years. And uh, I thought it was great. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a pretty concise. And it's all stuff like, uh, I mean, I recognize a ton of it, if not almost all of it. And I'm like, and most, and, and I feel like almost all of it is stuff that's not really even questionable whether the feds were involved. So it's like, it's not like kooky stuff. You're like, I don't know. Most of that stuff is pretty much, okay, yeah, the feds. I mean, obviously like 9-11, I know I'm not saying it's like an inside job, but at the very least, even if you're on the very, very light end of the conspiracy side of it, you got to at least admit there's definitely weird uh, you know, you can obviously attribute the the their involvement in kind of lifting up the uh, the the Taliban, you know, prior. And then also there's the aspect of like whether there's foreknowledge and even then whether there was foreknowledge or not after the fact. I know it's like damn near confirmed that they uh, the feds very much whisked off some essential Saudi people because uh, they had some weird connections and stuff. I mean, I don't know the details. That's definitely uh, more. Uh, God, what's his name? Uh, fuck, I'm forgetting his name. Uh, I'm trying to Adam uh, Fitzgerald. Yeah, Adam Fitzgerald. There you go. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely his more his territory. But there, it's pretty undeniable. Even if you're on the light side of the conspiracy stuff, there's definitely some weird Fed connections. Not saying it was an inside job or they did it particularly, but to some extent, you know, it's a, at least the result of their actions, whether intentional or unintentional. So, and then the, the aftermath, you know. But um, yeah, uh, all right. Let's before we can do it, uh, keep wanting to do this every single time. Uh, let people know who you are, let, give them your credentials, you know, that way I, I guess I want to continue to remind people where you're not just pulling the shit out of your ass. This is stuff you have sources for, uh, you've done the work. Uh, I mean, obviously go double check the stuff. We're, we're about to give the sources right here so you can go check them out to make sure we're not just pulling smoke up, up your ass. Um, so that way people know this is all legit. Uh, I mean, obviously to some extent you can probably kind of tell if you're intelligent when we, when we use conjecture, but for the most part, all this stuff is stuff that you have sources for. Absolutely right. So I'm Richard Booth. I, you know, read about, write about the Oklahoma City bombing. And uh, I have donated my archive of research materials to the Libertarian Institute, which you can find at libertarianinstitute.org slash OKC. Um, you can find there many hundreds of news clippings, FBI documents, ATF documents, all kinds of documents that I have on this case that I obtained uh, from research, other researchers, uh, such as uh, Roger Charles, provided me a great deal of documents, and he wrote a book on the bombing called Oklahoma City, What the Investigation Missed, which is really kind of what started me down this path. And then also mm -hmm. I've obtained a lot of material from Wendy Painting, who wrote a fantastic book on the bombing as well, called Aberration in the Heartland of the Real. And so uh, those, all of the documents that I kind of amassed I wanted to have in one place online for potential students to access and uh, Scott Horton at the Libertarian Institute graciously offered to host them on his server and they're all searchable and it's a, a useful resource for students. Yeah and then uh, the purpose of this podcast series if you guys haven't tell, been able to tell we're on part five right now so, and we've been going deep on like almost every little nitnoid character although I wouldn't say nitnoid these are there's a reason we're going deep because I think they're all important. So, I mean, I, I'm trying to make this essentially you taking that stuff and doing our best to kind of have all of it and crafting uh, a, a sort of and not necessarily a narrative, uh, more providing the stories possible narratives along the way. That way, this is kind of a quick and easy. And then if you want to then go look into it deeper, uh, different strokes for different folks, because I, I know not everyone's going to go deep through the sources and I don't know if you like content like this. But with that, I'm trying to I mean, someone asked today, you know, hey, you should do 10 episodes. And I'm like, I'm all for it. Uh, if, there, if we have enough content, uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep digging. Uh, I'm willing to do. Uh, we still have, I think, five or six more major or major slash minor characters I want to cover. Uh, I don't know. I don't think everyone everyone of them merits an entire episode, but if they do, I don't care. We'll cover an entire episode in each little character. I'm completely fine with that. Um, but yeah, I do want to remind you guys if you're watching the live stream. Uh, once again, I will try to get to. If you have any pertinent questions, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll bring them up. Uh, you know, obviously, I see a bunch of guys in the chat. Uh, thanks for showing up. I see, I see my, uh, I see Junkie Jeff. I see 
Kyle Howell, one of my uh, one of my patrons. I see Fire Pixie, I see Anna Banana, I see all you guys there. I see you. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop in. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll gladly answer them. They'll probably be saved more towards the end. That way we uh, don't get too thrown off. Uh, um, and yeah, uh, I, I do want to start out with, uh, like I said, this is going to be more like, oh hey, Force Mommy. I want to make this more like a uh, this episode. I think we're going to go to more like John Doe two because uh, we've covered uh, Strassmar, Roger Moore. We've covered Nichols, which were, I think were all, you know, super essential. And I think in the order of importance, this actually makes sense. And don't get me wrong, John Doe 2 is important, but, you know, I think uh, I think those ones in a certain sense kind of uh, take it over. But I do want to cover John Doe 2, and I, uh, the reason why is because then we're going to start going to other characters, and I want this to be in the forefront of people's mind as in future episodes we go through these individual characters. Like, is this John Doe 2? A uh, wink, wink, hint, hint. Probably not. None of the guys really fit the the, the bill of the character. Uh, not to spoil it, but I do think it's important to keep in mind that there is this John Doe two character out here that's very uh, involved in what the hell is going on. Uh, but yeah, I I do. Before we get into that, uh, and this to remind you, this is you know to some extent uh, this endeavor is also being crafted by you guys watching the show. Uh, people bring up different stuff that we forget or different questions. Someone brought up. Uh, and I feel like it's fitting since we just covered Nichols, uh, the death of Nichols, uh, essentially stepson, uh, the child of his uh, second wife that he got in the Philippines, 15 year old when he picked her up, which I mean, obviously is weird, but whatever uh, she, you know, we can move past that. But she was pregnant when he put, brought her back to the States and had the kid. And he basically raised the kid as his own. And I was not aware that he died and there's weird for, uh, circumstances around it. And then I also... We, we were talking kind of behind the scenes that's led to another conversation that some other stuff about McVeigh. And I do think this is pertinent information to kind of be able to understand the characters we're dealing with, with Nichols and with McVeigh. Uh, and it kind of really definitely plays on what we were kind of talking about last uh, last week with uh, Nichols kind of looking like maybe he was just some sort of guy who got in over his head and was kind of just scared and didn't really have the option to get out to some extent. So, uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've gone on enough. Uh, I, I want to hear... I want to hear about the kid that died and that will probably lead to other conversation. Yeah. So yeah, Nichols, it was his, uh, I guess you could say like his stepson, but he did raise the, the child as his son. His name was Jason. And uh, like you said, uh, Mara Faye was pregnant when uh, they got married and Mara Faye told Terry, you know, um, that she, you know, admitted that the child was not his. And she said, you know, if you want to end it, I understand and all that kind of thing. And, and they reconciled and anyway Nichols did end up you know signing the birth certificate he did uh, raise the child as his own and there you know people in Nichols in his family um, there was some pushback some people in the family for example didn't think the kid was good enough and they even said you know that, that he should be using cloth diapers because he, he's not good enough to to deserve um, disposable diapers and kind of a sh crappy thing to say, but, uh, he just ignored them and, you know, he gave the child love and attention and did act as his father. Now, having said that, um, in November of 1993, he did die on Nichols property. Um, at, when this happened, Terry Nichols and James Nichols were out in the field. They were, it's a farm. They're working out on the farm. And Tim McVeigh happened to be staying with them when this happened. And what happened here is Mara Fay, um, she went into Jason's room. She found him on the floor unresponsive. And he had a plastic bag over his head stored in that same room, his room with his crib. There was a lot of packing material and uh, evidently that included a lot of plastic bags that had to do with the materials that Nichols sold at gun shows and it was terry's idea to put these packing materials in jason's room which is what led marifay to later have some kind of uh, suspicions about whether or not terry might have been involved in his death so anyway what happens here is marifay finds the boy and she goes and she starts pounding on the door where in the room where mcveigh is sleeping and mcveigh comes out and he uh he does render cpr to the child um, but, you know, he, he was definitely at that time deceased. And so they go out and they get Terry and James and come back to the farmhouse. And uh, Terry called 911. 
And one thing that caused Marifay to be rather maybe suspicious of him is that she swears that uh, Nichols told the dispatcher uh, that Jason had had a plastic bag over his head. However, uh, she had not yet told Terry that. And so she's thinking, well, how does he know that? How did he know that that's how he was found? And of course, with Tim McVeigh being a mass murderer, known mass murderer, there's been you know, great speculation about whether or not he actually, you know, was involved in this. And maybe did he kill the kid? And, uh, you know, the FBI was interested in that. They were wondering whether or not maybe he was testing himself to see if he could, you know, murder a child or something like that. You know, his ideology, of course, um, he, he had problems anyway with the kid due to his race. And so there were legitimate questions about that. Ultimately, what can be said is that uh, there was no proof, no, not the sort of evidence you'd find at a crime scene, I guess you could say. So if McVeigh did kill this child or was involved in murdering the kid with Terry Nichols, they just didn't have any sort of evidence to show that, which of course doesn't rule it out. It's still certainly possible. And one thing I think about is, well, if he was testing himself to see if he could murder a kid or something like that, you look at it when it happened, it was November of 93. So it was quite some time before the Oklahoma City bombing. And so that kind of blends to the against that being the theory. But on the other hand, when you look at Nichols later statements where he talks about uh, he doesn't want to say much for fear for his family's safety, you could think, well, you know, if he had someone who he considered his son murdered, uh, that would certainly be in the forefront of his mind, and y it wouldn't take much to tell him, hey, we could make this happen again if you don't fall in line. So that's certainly a possibility. I know when we talked, uh, you know, kind of in our DMs, uh, we were, you did seem to think it was probably McVeigh. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming it's, I mean, obviously we're in conjecture territory here because, like you said, there's no proof, but I'm assuming you're, you're uh, kind of leaving that because of the fact that uh, obviously, the timeline's a little shaky. Uh, obviously, Nichols probably kill, could have killed the kid, gone out to the to, to the yard, and you know I don't know. It depends on how long it was. So the mother checked on the child uh, in between. Uh, I'm assuming it's just because of the fact that he was out there, and also just kind of a rough analysis of the characters we're dealing with, uh, based on uh, you know how it's kind of been sort of shown how Nichols is. He like we is shown, shown that he's very concerned about his family. Uh, and it does kind of, you know, lead to the aspect of like, this is why this guy, uh, is so hesitant to talk. Is, is there anything else you have conjecture wise, uh, of why you think with McVeigh aside from that? Yeah, it's just a general suspicion based upon, um, uh, his character and what kind of person he was. And that coupled with the fact that Nichols was so, um, put so much stock and the idea that someone can get to his family. That leads me to think that he probably had something happen in his life. Um, and, and, you know, Jason's death fits the bill for that perfectly. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, like you said, it is conjecture. But if it was not an accident, I do think the, the, the biggest chance is, is that it would have been McVeigh who was responsible and that he this may have been something he did uh, and one of the reasons i when i talk about uh, his character when you you look at some of the things that mcveigh did to terry nichols it looks a lot like um, almost like a psychopath or kind of a bully and one of the things that he did is he told terry nichols one day that he wanted him to know what it was like to be in war and so Nichols goes out about 200, 300 feet away and uh, McVeigh has his rifle and he tells Nichols, he says, when I yell out, I want you to roll. He's there on the ground and he wants him to, you know, roll. And so McVeigh starts laying down fire. He starts shooting at Nichols and, you know, shouting before he fires the shot. And so Nichols is basically out there dodging bullets, you know, and really a kind of a I think kind of a bullying situation and one where he's exerting this sort of predatory uh, dominance over Nichols. And, you know, he used Nichols, he used him for his money 
he used his calling card. Uh, he made nickels, you, you know, rent the storage lockers. And so he really is throughout their relationship exerting this kind of uh, dominance over him. And it would not, I don't think, be out, out of McVeigh's character to ensure that Terry does whatever he says by showing him, look, you know, I'll kill your kid. I don't even care. And just based on the fact that I know McVeigh knew there were kids there in the daycare, I know he'd actually visited that daycare. And so it just speaks to the kind of person he is. And then based on the pattern of their relationship and the type, the way that he was dominating and bullying uh, with Nichols, I would not put it past him. So, you know, it's really, I don't have any proof, but I do have a strong suspicion that McVeigh might have been involved in that death. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of in our conversation led to, I was kind of, you know, wondering to me, he you know, sounds like a bully. Uh, I was never in combat in the military, uh, but I, I uh, and I, I've met people who are combat in the military and stuff, you know, uh, different branches, et cetera. Uh, and usually the type of people you get, uh, usually the people who actually saw legitimate combat aren't usually tend to be the quiet ones. Uh, you know, they, I mean, I, I've known older old timers that were in uh, old wars and yeah, they may end up having their own issues, but they never were blowhards and, you know, uh, gloating about uh, anything or, you know, acting like this made them some great big man. It's always seems to be the ones who either didn't see combat or, or maybe, you know, they were there, but didn't really see it. Uh, and I, I, you, we, that kind of brought up us talking about his time in the military uh, and I kind of want, and you brought up a few things. So I, I guess I'd like to get you to elaborate on a little bit, you know, the kind of what McVeigh saw, you know, what kind of uh, actual combat he saw, uh, what role he served in combat, um, you know, what kind of, you know, uh, shit that he said he did while he was there. Uh, Cause I do think that provides a valuable insight into his psyche. Sure. Yeah. The type of combat he experienced was absolutely nothing compared to most American combat veterans. You have to understand, you know, he was in the Gulf War where they're fighting largely Saddam Hussein's conscripts. And these are people who um, oftentimes the American military would show up and they would just all start surrendering. So here you have McVeigh and he's in the most powerful military in the world. And he is in a, an armored um, Bradley fighting vehicle. And he was basically shooting Iraqis from the safety of the interior of this Bradley vehicle from long distances. And oftentimes, in some cases, people who are surrendering were people who did not obviously have arms um, in some cases. And they would do things like uh, the, the group he was with, with these Bradleys, it, this is recounted in Wendy Painting's excellent book, um, where they talk about actually just driving over Iraqis in, in the Bradley, just running them over and burying them in the sand. And one of the soldiers uh, had said that they called uh, those types of combatants crunchies uh, based on the, on the sound of uh, uh, their bones crunching when the ATV rolled over them. So he was very much in a position where he was fighting an unfair, I would, I would say like a, an unfair uh, war. He, he, did, he was not facing an adversary that was as skilled or as motivated or threatening or deadly as he was. And so he was in a position where he was massively overpowered, basically, and uh, I, I wouldn't compare the things he went through with the sort of things that people went through in uh, Gulf War II under George W. Bush. I think that they were facing um, a much more skilled um, skilled group of combatants um, and like the different fighters you were seeing in Iraq and uh, during W. Uh, that was a very different war uh, than his father. It was over pretty very quickly, the first Gulf War. And uh, yeah, he didn't face anybody. I don't think that was even remotely um, life-threatening for him. Uh, I, I want to let people know uh, this, uh, you know, obviously there's no, I don't think there's a stream going aside maybe on Twitter. Uh, uh, just so people know, it, I do stream these uh, to the Twitter, the Tower Power Hour Twitter, because uh, I've had my Twitter removed too many times to keep it to mine. Uh, but uh, apparently they yanked it from YouTube. I just quickly looked at my email and it says something about violent content. I'm assuming it was the intro that did it. 
Uh, yeah, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I mean, okay, fair enough. There is some, I guess, but I don't, I mean, that's pretty wild, but okay. They don't uh, like it when you show the CIA <laughs> blowing off the president's head. Yeah, uh, I mean, okay. Uh, well, I guess I'll probably, when I have to release this later, I'll probably have to uh, edit out the, uh, <laughs> the, the intro. So uh, you'll you'll not get that. Uh, I'll probably leave it in the MP3 version, which, but you, whatever, you won't be able to see it. Uh, I mean, I don't know if it'll, I might have to manually upload it to Odyssey. I feel like Odyssey probably won't yank it. So, because uh, I know usually they mirror it, but I don't know how that works if you get half an episode. Uh, if it'll go to Odyssey, but all right, so we lost our live stream. Uh, but you know, aside from on Twitter, uh, but uh, okay, uh, it is what it is. We'll, we'll keep moving, and it'll just this will have to be essentially like a recording type thing, uh, unless you're watching on Twitter. But all right, well, uh, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> um, but let's, I guess, let's move on to John Doe too. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, let me get my notes back up. Uh, that kind of threw me off. <laughs> um, mm. Yeah, uh, so let's start with kind of who 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 was John Doe to uh, kind of like how did how did we even know there was a John Doe to et cetera? Yes, so I think John Doe to is an important figure, pretty much just as important, I believe, as Andy Strassmeyer and Roger Moore. The only difference is we just don't know what his name is or his identity, and so to kind of summarize how we know there's a John Doe to is um, in the day of the bombing, the FBI was able to trace the rear axle to the bomb truck to a writer rental shop in Kansas. And uh, they went there within, uh, it was it was within several days of the truck being rented. The truck was rented on April 17th. And the FBI shows up there in the late hours of the 19th, early morning hours of the 20th to interview the three people who are working in the writer rental shop. And those three people um, were Tom Kessinger, um, owner Eldon Elliott and Vicki Beamer. In addition, there was a mechanic at the uh, location named Fernando Ramos. And Fernando Ramos said that he saw the two men arrived in a, in a Jeep Grand Cherokee. And then these other three witnesses described the two people who picked up the rider truck on the 17th. They provided uh, descriptions uh, which were used to draw up sketches of the two suspects. And these sketches were then distributed to the media and they were dubbed John Doe 1 and John Doe 2. Uh, the John Doe 1 sketch is widely believed to be Timothy McVeigh. It looks a great deal like him. There are several people who identified him based on that sketch. Now, all of those witnesses state that when McVeigh came in to pick up the rider truck, he had this other person with him this person was described by the FBI on April 20th as being approximately five foot eight, uh, five foot nine, something like that, uh, about 160 to 175 pounds, uh, dark hair, um, powerful upper body, a uh, tattoo on his, uh, t just below his t-shirt sleeve. I can't remember now if it's on the right or the left arm. I think they said the left arm, but I, I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, yeah, he had this tattoo on his arm. Yeah, like I said, very powerful upper body. Everyone who noticed this guy, because it's not just these three witnesses at the body shop who uh, observed this individual. There were many, many other witnesses who saw McVeigh with another person in tow who matched this exact description. And almost all of them uniformly say that this man had a powerful upper body. They described him using terms like he looked like a bodybuilder. Uh, he had big, strong arms. He had a thick bull neck. And so he definitely uh, was in peak physical condition or might actually, you know, have done a lot of working out. Um, and that just doesn't match the description of some of the other people uh, that we know on this case. So in addition to the people at the Ryder Rental Agency who saw this guy with McVeigh, um, every witness who saw McVeigh in Oklahoma City on April 19th, uh, when he delivered the bomb, and there were about 20 some odd witnesses in, from downtown Oklahoma City, um, all of them saw McVeigh with a second person. And some of these witnesses are very good witnesses, including a man named Rodney Johnson. He was driving a uh, catering truck in front of the Murrah building. And uh, he was just passing by the Murrah building when he had to slam on his brakes 
because two men had uh, just got out of a rider truck and ran out into the street. They were crossing the street. So he has to slam on his brakes to, you know, avoid hitting these two men. And he got a good look at the two. And he told the FBI a description of the two men he saw. And those descriptions matched John Doe 1 and John Doe 2 from the Ryder uh, Rental Agency. And he later identified uh, one of the men that he saw as Timothy McVeigh. When he saw McVeigh on television, he said, that was the guy I saw. And uh, so he, this is a man who he saw them leaving the Ryder truck when they parked it right there at the scene of the crime. He could have been called to testify in court and he could have left no question that Timothy McVeigh was the one who delivered that bomb. But what we'll find here is that the prosecution, uh, what they did is uh, they pulled kind of a trick where they did not call any of the witnesses from Oklahoma City, not one. They called no one. Instead, they take Roger Moore, who I think should have been a co-defendant, and they make him a key witness. And then they take Michael Fortier, who also had some involvement, and they make him a key witness. So they essentially take his two cons uh, co-conspirators and they have them point the finger at McVeigh to avoid having to call any witnesses into court because every single one of these witnesses would have been asked by the defense if anyone else was with McVeigh. And every single one of those witnesses would have to say yes, he did have someone with him. So in addition to Rodney Johnson, for example, on the morning of the bombing, um, when they're driving the Ryder truck and the downtown Oklahoma City, they have to navigate to the Murrah building in which there are many one-way streets in downtown Oklahoma City. It's kind of a maze to navigate. It's kind of a pain, not easy to get to certain locations because you have to take one one-way street down and then make a turn, then another one-way street. So anyway, they're having some difficulty navigating downtown as they're approaching the Murrah building from a different angle than they had previously when they had cased the building. So they stopped at a place called Johnny's Tire, where it was a couple blocks away from the Murrah building, and they asked for directions. And so this rider truck pulls into Johnny's Tire at about 8.30 in the morning. And that's right when uh, an individual named uh, Byron Marshall was just getting to work. And he had a co-worker there already named Mike Maraz. And they had a, a supervisor there as well. And all three of those people said that they saw this rider truck pull into Johnny's Tire at about 8.30. Well, they took Mike Maraz, one of the employees, is a mechanic there at Johnny's Tire, and they sent him out to see what these gentlemen needed. And in the truck was Tim McVeigh. He was driving, and he was asking for directions on how to get to the Murrah building from there. And Maraz gave him directions, and he did not seem to quite be understanding it so well. So he offered uh, to, he asked McVeigh to step out of the truck, and he opened the door, and he steps out of the truck. And Mike Maraz is then pointing to downtown and giving him directions. And McVeigh is listening, and it seems like he's understanding. It's an encounter that takes maybe two or three minutes at the most. He gets back in the truck. Mike Maraz goes back inside Johnny's tire. And while he's in there, he's joking with his coworkers because this rider truck sits in the parking lot for what seems like about five minutes before it pulls out into the traffic. Now, Mike Maraz has always said that in that rider truck with McVeigh was a passenger. There was another man sitting in the passenger seat. And we believe that to be John Doe too. The same man that was seen at the rider rental agency and the same man that was seen getting out of the rider truck by Rodney Johnson. And so these are just a couple of the witnesses who uh, saw this person. And so he was considered a, a key figure in the investigation. And, he, you know, his uh, sketch was in the newspaper. The FBI was talking about looking for him. And I was following the story with great interest in the newspaper after McVeigh was captured because I wanted to know who this other person was. And ultimately, he was never identified. And along with that comes a lot of questions. And what we're seeing here is in the FBI's investigation, it appeared that at some point, the higher ups in the FBI investigation must have determined that this gentleman was in some way a liability to the FBI. The reason I say that is they decided to simply come out and say that he doesn't exist. 
And they did that in June of 1995, just a few months after the bombing. So they come out, the FBI says that he does not exist. And they come up with this bogus story. And what the FBI does is they say, oh, well, the witnesses at the body shop, they were all 100% accurate about John Doe 1. They all got that perfectly right. But they were also 100% wrong about John Doe 2. They were wrong about him. They were confusing him for someone else. As two other individuals had gone into the Ryder rental shop to rent a truck on the 18th, the day after McVeigh and John Doe 2 rented their truck. And what the FBI says is that these witnesses were viewing those two men on the 18th and remembering them when they're describing to the FBI who picked up the bomb truck. Uh, but the problem with that is that the uh, owner of the body shop, Eldon Elliott, was not at work on April 18th. And so he, if he's not at work on the 18th, he didn't see these other two men. And so he can't confuse them for anybody. And he was adamant in his court testimony that McVeigh was there with another person, that he had to walk between the two of them when he did a uh, inspection of the truck. Um, and the other two witnesses also were um, equally certain about there being another person. And then also uh, one thing to note is that when the FBI did their preliminary, or well, the, the Justice Department did their preliminary hearing on April 27th to show that they had reasonable cause and suspicion for proceeding uh, with with uh, uh, charges against McVeigh. Um, they outlined a number of uh, these witnesses that I've talked about. Their chief witness that day was an um, FBI agent named John Hursley. And John Hursley was questioned under oath by Merrick Garland, our current attorney general. And Merrick Garland, I uh, was asking him questions about, you know, what did you see and, or what did your witnesses see? And it's, uh, what, what he's basically doing is John Hursley is saying we have this witness who saw McVeigh in the truck. We said we have this witness who saw McVeigh driving the truck. And when that happened, the defense attorney asked, he said, um, he said, oh, you said uh, individuals in the truck, plural. Was there more than one person in this truck? And Merrick Garland objected. He objected to that, and that objection was overruled. And so John Hursley was forced to answer that question, and he did and said, yes, there were two people in the truck, and Mr. McVeigh was the driver. And so he is there under oath uh, being questioned by our current attorney general, and he's saying with certainty that there were two people in the bomb truck on April 19th. And Merrick Garland has never explained to us why he and his people at the Department of Justice never identified that second man, and in fact, have changed their story on that second man. And he had multiple other witnesses, too, that were alluded to in that preliminary hearing. The one I mentioned named Rodney Johnson, the catering truck driver, he was alluded to by John Hursley during the preliminary hearing. He mentioned, mentioned him. Uh, he mentioned... Uh, a gentleman who was, uh, well, he didn't use his name, but he was referring to Mike Moraz. And uh, so he's, all these witnesses that I talk about are the same, very same witnesses that the Department of Justice used in their preliminary hearing to show that McVeigh was their suspect. But then when it came time for trial, none of them appeared. And it's obvious why none of them appeared at trial. You know, it's because every one of them saw McVeigh with another guy. And we also have to think back to something I covered on a previous episode, this figure named Robert Jacks, you know, in the fall of 94, Nichols and McVeigh and a third man are showing up to buy property in uh, Missouri. And it's in the middle of the bombing plot when they're sourcing bomb components and so forth. And this guy is a key figure based upon the fact that the witnesses say that he was the one doing all the talking. He was the boss of the group. He was like clearly the leader. And he's there in the middle of the bombing plot. And that, that there is another person who's like John Doe too, insofar as that he's a key suspect who has not been identified. And there are some similarities between this Jack's figure and this John Doe too. They were both uh, very muscular 
and witnesses describe them as having a military bearing, like a, a presence uh, that reminded them of someone who might be active duty military. And so these are the basics of what we know about John Doe II. Uh, but what you can say as well is that when uh, McVeigh was driving into Oklahoma City starting on the late night of April 19th, uh, or I should say early in the morning on April 19th, like at 12 midnight, one in the morning, um, he's driving into Oklahoma City and he stops at a an Easy Mart in Kansas and he pulls in there to uh, put fuel in the rider truck. He goes inside the Easy Mart to use the restroom. And meanwhile, John Doe too comes inside the Easy Mart and he picks out a sandwich from the deli counter. And this witness, his name is Richard Sinnott. Uh, he said that um, McVeigh came out of the restroom and paid for the gas and paid for John Doe II's sandwich. And then they both walked out the door together. And then he proceeded to watch as the two argued with one another right outside the door where McVeigh was very animated and kind of in John Doe II's face. And they obviously upset about something. And then he watched as uh, McVeigh kind of got in his face like a top sergeant, you know, like a drill instructor or something. And then he goes and gets back into the rider truck and John Doe too as well. And they start to pull out. And as they start to pull out, Richard Sinnott notices that a pickup truck and a sedan were actually out there in the lot, which he didn't know from his vantage point. He didn't see until they started to pull out. But they go start to pull out and he sees that it's a convoy. There is a rider truck. There is a pickup truck and a sedan. And they all pull out together and continue down the highway together. And so that that is where the witness accounts start on April 19th. So they start with multiple people and they end with multiple people. When you have a witness who saw McVeigh fleeing the scene, you know, with Rodney Johnson, he sees two people fleeing and all of the witnesses in between saw the same thing. They just remember McVeigh and they remember him having another guy with him. And to me, what got my interest in this case is that uh, the, when the FBI said John Doe 2 does not exist, I thought, oh, wow, I'm, they're making up something here. I'm being lied to because I'd read all these accounts and they'd seen the sketch and I'd read all about it. And now all of a sudden he's not real. That doesn't you know, make any sense to me. And that's what's persist, uh, caused me to persist with my interest in the case this, this, you know, this many years. Uh, I don't know if you touched on this. Uh, I know you did bring up the appearance. Uh, I Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, maybe I missed you saying this. Or maybe it didn't. Uh, it, the sketches and uh, the descriptions, they said he, if I recall correctly, he kind of was of a darker complexion. So maybe like a light skinned black fellow, maybe even a dark skinned guy. You know, whether it's a white guy that gets a lot of time in the sun. Because uh, I, you know, I, I get pretty tan or, you know, Italian, Hispanic. And then also his facial features, if you look at it, do kind of look like maybe there's something a little bit, you know, just ethnically different than just a generic white guy am i off there is that is that was that a thing because I, I feel like you maybe didn't touch on that or, or maybe i'm wrong well, if i yeah I, if i left that out my apologies you are yeah. correct you are correct there he was described as having a darker complexion and some people described him and they would say possibly american indian some people would say uh, he might have been mexican uh, there's another person who said he might have been half white and half Pacific Islander, you know, like maybe he was part Filipino or something like this. Um, so there definitely was some confusion over this gentleman because all of the witnesses did describe him as having a darker or all, some would even say it said an olive complexion. So it runs the gamut, you know, you could be dealing about, you could be talking about someone who's an Italian, you could be talking about a guy with a deep tan, could be talking about someone who is Native American someone uh, who is maybe part Mexican. But what's so confounding about that is the fact that McVeigh and all the people that he ran with were, were basically white supremacists. And so they're not, yeah, it's not the kind of guy that they'd normally hang out with, you know? Um, so that right there in itself is, uh, is kind of confounding, but that is indeed what they said they saw. So that's what we should report.
Yeah, I did, just thought it was important to bring that up because, like, we will be going to other characters and a lot of people say, who's John Doe 2? And bring up those people and you can go look at their pictures and see who they look like. And, uh, like, I did, this guy's obviously ethnically ambiguous, uh, I guess is a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, so, but you look at somebody like, uh, I don't know, Strassmeyer or I'm trying to remember who the guy who had the pretty pretty boy like 90s hair uh maybe that was maybe that was more or that was a uh, i think brescia maybe is a, maybe brescia i know there was some characters but you you can tell when you look at him like oh no this guy is like not th that kind of you know ethnically ambiguous because you can i mean like you look at timmy Vivet, you don't want to describe him as anything other than a white guy right. uh you know like i mean maybe somebody could look at me and think italian i'm not that dark right now but when i'm in the sun a lot i do get very dark uh so but you know uh some people like my friend Top Lobster that I brought up earlier. If you see him, uh, he's uh, Puerto Rican, but you look at him and you could you could probably make conjecture different things. So, but I do think it's important to bring up. So, uh, if you're trying to figure out who it is, um, it, it is, and you yeah. you also can uh, rule out certain figures based on um, their build. Um, a lot of people would like to say, well, I think Rich Richard Guthrie, or I think that Andy Strassmeyer is John Doe too, and I would rule them out for various factors i used to think when i first started reading about this and looking into it i was convinced that it was andy strassmeyer but um looking at him and he first of all he's too tall he's like six one six two he's tall and uh he just didn't have the the physical build uh as john doe too and neither does richard guthrie uh, though richard guthrie did have a tan a, a lot of times he just didn't have the build and my thought is, I tend to think that whoever John Doe 2 was, I think that he was an informant or a provocateur of some kind, based on the fact that the FBI behaved in a way that they would not behave for a regular criminal defendant. Uh, if you have someone who is a criminal that you're after, you're not going to start making excuses for them. You're not going to say that they don't exist. Uh, you're not going to, in fact, I have a document that was sent by the uh, San Francisco field office, and it was talking about uh, some other unrelated matters. It doesn't well, it doesn't matter really what it was talking about, but there's a section there at the end that says that um, in view of the fact that the Oklahoma City Command Post has directed all offices to hold John Doe number two leads in abeyance, I have no further, you know no further stuff on this matter. And I actually had to look that up when I first saw it. I didn't know what abeyance meant, but uh, yeah, I guess it means that uh, to hold hold leads in abeyance means we're, we're not pursuing them. And this was dated May, May of 95. So in May of 95, we know that the Oklahoma City Command Post for OK Bomb directed all field offices to stop pursuing John Doe 2 leads. Then about a month later, they come out, well, less than a month, 15 days or so, they come out and say that he doesn't exist with his cover story for the American people. So not only are they covering up who he is uh, for the American people, but they also seem to be um, making it hard for the street agents in the FBI, because you got to think about it this way. In the, in the FBI, you probably have a lot of really good agents that are just really, they just want to solve crimes or whatever. And these street level agents maybe don't know anything about any sort of conspiracy. And they're going to keep pursuing these leads unless they're told otherwise. And so someone high up in the FBI investigation realizes that this guy is a liability, that he's some type of informant or asset he actually would have to direct those agents to, hey, stop, stop doing this, you know, and he doesn't have to give a reason why. When the FBI tells you to do something, you just do it. All right. So you say May, the, uh, the, uh, you stop looking into it order comes out June, yes. they just drop it all, uh, officially drop it all together. Uh, and then, but the, it was a month prior to May, I believe that, uh, so April, uh, I guess roughly was was when OKC the bombing happened. Right, a right. A April nineteenth, okay. and you're talking like maybe two and a half to three weeks later, they're telling people to stop looking for John Doe two. Meanwhile, publicly they're pretending that they're still looking for him, which they continue to do for about a month. In June, what's interesting is while they tell the newspapers and they tell people that John Doe two doesn't exist, and they give us this misidentification theory. Uh, you can tell people aren't buying it. The press isn't buying it. So 
the Department of Justice officials are kind of talking out of two sides of their mouth because I have this one article from June 15th where on the one hand, he says John Doe 2 doesn't exist. It's a misidentification. And then on the other hand, in the same article, this guy, uh, his name is, I think, Mullins, a DOJ spokesman named Mullins. He said that, uh, oh, we're still looking for him. So he says, you know, he doesn't exist. But then, oh, don't worry, we're still looking for him. You really get a the feeling and the gut impression that there is some dishonesty going on with that based upon that and it's uh, that in and of itself that, that they're going to try to uh, pass this bogus story out and then send you mixed messages by saying, oh, we're still looking for him, which they they did that for a couple months after they would keep pushing the misidentification theory and at the same time try to, you know, allay your allay your fears or suspicions by saying that we're still looking for him. All right. Uh, well, are there any other major and or minor aspects of John Doe too that you would like to cover uh, before we move on? Um, well, let me think here. Well, with John Doe too, just the main things I'd like to cover is um, just to emphasize that they're, um, well, for example, what I think I'd like to say is that uh, Danny Colson is an FBI agent who was uh, in charge of the crime scene at the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. And he was interviewed by the BBC in, I think it was 2007. And he appeared on a BBC special about the bombing, uh, you know, because he was part of the investigation. And Danny Colson said on that broadcast um, that he believes there is something to John Doe too. What he said is that we have 21 witnesses who saw Tim McVeigh in downtown Oklahoma City with another person. He'd say, I would understand if it was maybe one or two, but 21 people, that's a lot. You know, he said that that's pretty powerful. And I agree with him on that. And around the same time, Danny Colson also told uh, various uh, newspaper reporters that he believed that the case should be reopened even said that it should be reopened based upon this fact that this John Doe 2 is not identified and this Robert Jacks is not identified. And the fact that they just have so much, well, so much evidence, I would say it's circumstantial evidence, but it is evidence. And there is something else I would like to cover that I think is central to all of this. And I believe that the, the FBI knew on day one of the bombing who John Doe 2 was. The reason I say that is they had the bombing on videotape. The FBI had 22 videotapes of the surrounding area of the Murrah Federal Building. We know this from a FOIA lawsuit by David Hoffman, where the FBI discloses that they have 21 videotapes stored at the Oklahoma City Field Office and one videotape stored under lock and key at FBI headquarters in D.C. And so they, they disclose that they have these 22 videotapes. Now, separate from that, I have an FBI document that was written by an FBI agent named Pamela Matson, And Pamela Matson was tasked with reviewing all of the surveillance camera footage and making note of which videotapes were deemed positive in terms of evidentiary value. That is to say, it shows the bombing or the suspects or the perpetrators on it. And she reviewed these videotapes and in this document, she indicates that there are at least uh, two at least two of the, among the ones she reviewed. I want to say it was three. I, don't quote me on that. It's probably, it may have been two. I can't quite remember. But at any rate, it was at least two that she denoted as being positive in terms of evidentiary value. That is to say, it shows the bombing or it shows the suspects. Now, we also know that there was a video camera that was mounted at the Regency Towers Apartments, which is right down the street from the Murrah Building. And it was pointed directly where the rider truck would have pulled up and parked. If you had that videotape from the Regency Towers, you would be able to see the truck, you'd be able to see it's even, you'd be able to read its license plate, and you'd be able to see the two perpetrators stepping out of the rider truck. Okay, and I believe that the FBI got that video. And other confirmation of this surveillance camera footage uh, comes from uh, other FBI documents from October of 1995, where the FBI has some informants 
inside NBC, the news network. And what happened there is on October 30th, there was an FBI report generated that said they had a source inside NBC uh, who said that an FBI agent out of Los Angeles, California, was attempting to sell the video footage of the Murrah bombing to Dateline NBC for $1 million. And in this FBI document, it talks about the agent who's trying to sell it. It provides some information that might be enough for a good journalist to identify who he is. I'm certain he probably got fired from his job because they did investigate. They opened an Office of Professional Responsibility investigation to find out who it was trying to sell this videotape. Now, in these documents, there are several of them uh, from October uh, 30, uh, October 29th, 30 or 31 um, talking about this. And what we know from these documents and subsequent investigation is that the agent who was trying to sell the footage for $1 million screened this footage for Dateline NBC at an Orange County Sheriff's home. And it says in, uh, in these documents that the footage that was screened was a compilation tape. So it showed multiple camera angles including up to and including the bombing itself, even showing the explosion. Okay, so I believe what was screened there was probably the one tape that was under lock and key at FBI headquarters. I believe it was a compilation tape of all of their positive videos where they put in one tape all of the ones that they have in sequential order. And I believe that was probably what was screened there. And uh, this video was alluded to briefly by Danny Coulson in 1999, he was on book TV talking about his memoir. And when he was talking about his memoir, a book called No Heroes, he said, and this is on, on videos, the videos on YouTube, I put it on my channel. Danny Coulson says uh, about McVeigh, he says, we had him on videotape. We had videotape of the truck pulling up a couple minutes before nine. And so he admits it. And there's enough circumstantial evidence there coming from the FBI's own documents, it shows that they absolutely had videotape of this bombing, that it you know, necessarily would have shown what all of the witnesses saw, which was two men get out of the Ryder truck, so we would know with certainty that McVeigh had someone with him. And that was published in the newspaper, in fact, October 28th, 1995, headline story. This was published by Associated Press all over the United States, papers all over the U.S. It said that, uh, um, surveillance videotape uh, shows passenger and rider truck and law enforcement sources quoted in the article said that the tape is too grainy for you to be able to make out his face but you can see that there's a passenger sitting in the rider truck with McVeigh and then it comes from the surveillance tape and if you go back and you read the news stories in the bombing you know that I have on the Libertarian Institute these talk about the surveillance tapes. They talk about law enforcement is quoted talking about them. Law enforcement is quoted talking about the fact that there are two people on tape. They're quoted talking about the fact that they have a second getaway vehicle that they see in downtown Oklahoma City that has McVeigh's license plate on it. And it's it's not the Mar the Marriott Marquis. It's another vehicle. And the, there was speculated at the time in the newspaper that John Doe, too, might have made his escape from downtown Oklahoma City in this secondary vehicle. Um, and so, yeah, the surveillance tapes, I think, are also central to proving that there was another person with McVeigh, and that person, I believe, was this John Doe 2 figure. Yeah, and uh, if I maybe you said it already, but if I recall correctly, their excuse for where the surveillance tapes went was they lost them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just, oh, we don't know. And yeah. uh, it's just a little ridiculous to assume that many uh, surveillance tapes just whoop, they Well... Alter alternately, we lost them or what they what they did is uh, Jesse Trinidu went to, took them to court and he sued the FBI for these videotapes and he was successful and a judge forced the FBI to go back and produce some videotapes and what they produce is interesting. Uh, it's a set of different videos that all seem to stop working at 9.02 a.m. and then they resume a short while later, meaning the tapes are obviously edited. These tapes that were provided to Jesse Trinidu are missing the key moments that the law enforcement sources quoted in the newspaper who had seen the tapes said was there. None of that appears in what was released 
to Jesse Trinidou. And I believe, as Jesse believes, is that the material that was released to him was uh, sanitized, you know, if you will. It was cut. And uh, they probably have destroyed that material, I think. I don't think we're going to have any luck. Well, here's what's going to happen. One of two things, and I've been worried about this for some time, is I believe that it's possible at some time we might see a video appear. And this video will show one person getting out of the rider truck. It'll show McVeigh, and that's it. And I think it might be basically a CGI or deep fake type deal where it's been doctored. I could see that happening. Just the level of corruption we see here. If they're going to do something like this and cover up, who's to say they wouldn't do something like that? And so that's something that I anticipate might happen. And so if any new evidence or tapes all of a sudden appear, I'm going to be suspicious right away, especially if it doesn't show what the, the documents say it should show. Yeah, at this point, it's damn near an indisputable fact there was a second person, in my opinion. But, uh, you know, I think you may be right. And I would uh, hazard, I know it sounds crazy to people, you know, paying attention that, oh, my God, you know, that they would doctor it to that degree. But I would implore you, uh, okay, this sounds silly. Go, just go to YouTube, type in, uh, I forget what it's called, but Matt Stone, Trey Parker, Deep Fake. They have a little show they did just for funsies, you know, yeah. which I'm sure it probably wasn't high budget. Uh, where they just did deep fakes and they just made little comedic skits where they had people look like Biden, Trump, uh, whatever, just different different figures, Elon Musk, whatever, and just made them say ridiculous stuff and pretend it was them. And it looks, I mean, it, there's some points you can tell, uh, but I mean, there's it's this is just them, you know, just for funsies throwing together their own little, you know, probably low budget deep fake. And deep right. fakes are completely legit uh, to this day. So there's no reason why they couldn't doctor it and make that happen. sure well yeah. sure and if, if you think too about the videotape quality you know in 1995 on a surveillance camera it was probably like 320 by 200 uh, you know as far as a re poor resolution it would be real easy to doctor something like that and uh yeah that is taking it to an extreme level but i think if we ever reached a point like in jesse's case where the judge has been consistently ruling in his favor and forcing the fbi to produce things I would not put it past them for them to produce something that was bogus. Yeah, that or in 50 plus years, we may just get the full on legit thing, but no one cares at this point because that's how it works with all this crazy stuff. You know, Mockingbird, MK Ultra, Northwoods, you know, stuff gets released, you know, decades later when it's just no longer a thing. And then, you know, people who bring it up sound crazy because it's just become the, uh, you know, national discourse of the opposite right. or the different or, or not that. And so you sound crazy because most people don't look into these things. Right. So, Absolutely. These, are, these yeah. are a lot of, these are things that the feds, you know, fully admit, but then act like, Oh, well, we don't do that anymore. Okay. Right. <laughs> right. Just like the, the video you played there at the beginning, it had John Cypher saying, oh, well, yeah, that was stuff we did 50 years ago, but not mm -hmm. that was the early days. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one thing I've thought is that I, I think there probably are some retired FBI agents out there who have got a VHS tape down in their basement or up in a closet that has the surveillance tape footage on it. The reason I think that is that you had an agent here in Los Angeles who was not even assigned to the Oklahoma City bombing, who went into the evidence, made a copy of the surveillance tape, went and tried to sell it. So if you have one guy doing that, you know, who's to say other people didn't also make copies? And there was an article about this in a magazine that was uh, an article about the whole surveillance tape attempted sale. And they quoted an FBI agent in that article talking about this. And he said that there was one agent out of the Oklahoma City office who was running off a bunch of dubs of the surveillance footage for uh, like friends and fellow agents. And he said he was shocked in 1995, he was shocked that it had not yet appeared on like hard copy or a current affair because of the number of people who had access to it. So I think what happened is when the, the FBI's Office of Professional Responsibility, that's like their own internal affairs or FBI's version of HR, I think they investigated to see who every person was who had access to that surveillance tape. I'm sure they interviewed every single one of them. And I'm sure they made it very clear to every single one of them that if, should this tape appear outside of the investigation, that they would be prosecuted. And yeah, they would put the fear of God in them and you know, make sure that they fall in line. But having said that, 
I have no doubt there probably is an agent out there who's got a VHS tape. And I've been, you know, it's the biggest hope that something like, like this is a guy that gets up at, up there in years and he starts to feel bad about some of these things. And I want him to send it to me, you know, or to one of the other researchers, you know, to say, hey, you know, this was wrong here. You know, I'm on my way out. Take this and do what you will with it. Yeah, a little pro tip for anyone out there. Uh, this kind of touches on the uh, Operation Mockingbird I mentioned earlier. If you ever have stuff like this, don't go to the establishment media. Just don't. Right. You're, you're, that's a uh, which I mean, it's kind of funny. A Fed went to them thinking that would work, but he, I guess that kind of uh, goes to you know the ignorance of you know how, the tiered knowledge how that works. Because uh, I mean, obviously, I'm not saying 100 percent it was some sort of uh, Operation Mockingbird type thing, but I mean, we saw with the uh, you know, I think it was like a year or two ago, there was I forget which major network it was, but there was that person who had that leaked video that came out that was her fully admitting she had all this stuff on Epstein, and she was frustrated that the network wouldn't let her go onto it. And I guess the big thing was the so-called thing was because they were worried it would affect their uh, uh, their uh, relationship with the uh, with the royals in, in England. Uh, although, I mean, like, maybe that's simply the case. Maybe it's that simple. I mean, so it's obviously explainable with the easier ways of just they don't want to fuck up, you know, some of their, their big connects and stuff. But also, Operation Mockingbird was the thing. I implore people to go look into that. Uh, the establishment media. And, yeah, obviously they say, oh, we don't do that anymore. But it's like, okay, uh, sure. I mean, you look at major networks well, they do now, it. It's, yeah. There's just a different way of going about it. Yeah. John Brennan, I believe, is a, is a contributor for one of the major networks, I forget. And there's multiple mm. feds that are contributors. And it's it's they don't even really try to hide it too much, honestly. Right. So, now, yeah. yeah. Nowadays, they don't hide it. You know, yeah. they, they use their credentials as like, uh, as if it's part of their resume instead of trying to hide it, yeah. you know. And, you know, you're right about this with the uh, surveillance tape. Uh, it's funny that the guy, he wants his million dollars. He thinks he's going to get rich and retire. And he takes it to NBC. And the irony is, is that the FBI had an informant <laughs> at NBC. Yeah, of course uh, they did. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, I mean, although I guess you're not going to get the million dollars from some like Glenn Greenwald type or something, you know, uh, you know, but uh, I mean, that's the way to bust the story. I mean, maybe you know, I'd, I'd put somebody? it on YouTube. Yeah. If yeah. I got it, I, it would go online immediately. If I got that tape, I would I wouldn't even try to contact anyone to sell it. First thing I would do is make copies. I'd send copies to several people that I know and it would go on my YouTube channel right away yeah. i'd share it say hey this, this is what happened yeah uh, i'd definitely back it up on other platforms you know as it's seen with this episode yes uh, although i'm not saying that was necessarily fed stuff that happened this episode it little there were violent scenes in that although they were like Indeed. historical so it's like technically if i was some big wig i probably could fight that with youtube and maybe they would keep it because i think you probably could argue there's a case that it doesn't violate their community guidelines because of the historical educational side of it but whatever uh, I'm a dude with like a one one and a half thousand subscribers. That's uh, it's not a battle I'm gonna win. So uh, I'll just you know clip it. I'll probably pull out the uh, intro and then leave the intro on Odyssey. So yeah, if you ever do have something you. like that, make sure you drop it on Odyssey and other other platforms as well. Because right, uh, you I know, put you it think, on Rumble. You know, yeah, <laughs> yeah places are probably uh, multiple ones because they're they're probably they're some of even the ones that you think uh, even like DuckDuckGo kind of got. Uh, I remember a while ago they started a. Uh, I forget what they did, but they, uh, they, I, think, I don't remember exactly what they did, but they were very much starting to act like Google. So point being, uh, yeah, uh, don't don't trust any establishment uh, type stuff. But, all right, uh, we've covered John Doe 2. I guess to finish out this episode, and it, it weirdly kind of fits, you know, John Doe 2 kind of being heavily implied as some sort of foreman or something. Uh, let's talk on Carol Elizabeth Howe, because uh, that was a character I actually just found out about. I wasn't planning on talking about. Uh, I believe she is an out-and-out out fed. Uh, there's not even an argument about it. Uh, and there are some weird ties with her and the gang of, uh, the McVeigh folks essentially. So yes. I'll, I'll let you talk on that. Yeah. Yeah. Carol Howe, uh, she's a, an interesting figure. Um, you could say she's a fed. I mean, she was, I, I would call her a snitch. She was an informant. Um, she wasn't really a provocateur of any sort. Um, but she did provide a lot of very useful information. So her story is a kind of an interesting one. She was from kind of a rich family in uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, kind of like a, a preppy popular type girl, but she had kind of a wild streak in her. You know, she wasn't one of these preppy girls who is like all the others. She was more kind of wild and, and uh, 
what she did, I guess, is that um, she claims that she was assaulted in a park by two African-American men, which supposedly radicalized her. And so what she did is she reached out and contacted a gentleman by the name of Dennis Mahon. And Dennis Mahon is a guy who ran what, what, something called White Aryan Resistance in Oklahoma. And uh, people in Tulsa know who he is because, you know, he runs for mayor every time that comes around, that election comes around. He always runs for mayor. Of course, he always loses, but he always runs. And he's just known as a local loudmouth and a racist. And he had this dial a racist hotline where you could call this number and he had a recorded message every day. And so she started calling dial a racist and she eventually got in contact with Dennis Mahon. And uh, when she got in contact with them, they started talking to one another. They started seeing one another. She kind of developed a relationship with him. Well, Dennis Mahon started kind of grooming her to be like this emissary and face of the white separatist movement for women. Uh, because, he, as Mahon said, a lot of their women were very uneducated and they'll go on shows like Geraldo or whatever and curse and sound stupid. And whereas Carol Howe is very uh, intelligent. And so she, he thought she came across very well. So one thing to note is that at this time, Dennis Mahon, uh, he had a trailer at Elohim City and he would go and stay there for long periods of time. He started taking Carol Howe with him. And so she was at Elohim City in the fall of 1994. At the very same time, the bombing plot was formed there by Andy Strassmeyer, Tim McVeigh, um, and these others who we believe were involved. And so she was around when these meetings were happening and she was also fraternizing uh, with all of the key suspects and the key people there. So she was in a very good position to get information. Evidently, uh, Dennis Mahon was asserted to be abusive with her and uh, she re um, was resentful of that. And I don't know the exact details on this. I'm, I'd have to like, you know, study up on it because I'll offhand, I just don't remember. But ultimately what it comes down to is because of the way he was treating her and all this, she volunteered to the ATF to like, you know, inform on him. And so kind of a vindictive girlfriend type deal. So she goes to the ATF and they recruit her as a confidential informant and open a case on white area and resistance. And they are asking her lots of questions and they are asking her, um, or tasking her, that is, with going to Elohim City and doing things like writing down license plate numbers, getting the names of the people who are going there, telling um, telling what they're saying. And she did that. She gave them the names of everybody who was there. She told them that Andy Strassmeyer was talking about assassinations, mass shootings, bombings. Uh, she said that uh, Den Dennis Mahon and Andy Strassmeyer went with her in the fall of 94 to case the Murrah building. And that they did that about three times. They were looking at targets for a bombing. And this is around the very same time that this meeting happened, you know, in the fall of 94, where Andy Strassmeyer and Tim McVeigh and the others planned out this whole thing. And so she was right there in the thick of it. And her investigation eventually kind of went inactive, I guess. And what happened is, um, when the bombing happened, um, she was brought in on April 19th. She was brought into the FBI command center and she was debriefed. And a debriefing is where basically they just ask her questions. So they're asking her all these questions she's answering and telling what she knows. And the authorities, um, they begin to believe that um, there's a connection between the people she was reporting on and the people who carried out the bombing. And the ATF wants to send her back to Elohim City because they believe that suspect number two, John Doe two, is, might be at that location. And they also believe that people at Elohim City were involved in the bombing through conspiracy. And so they want to send her back. And something interesting happens. Um, her identity is compromised. So before she can go back to Elohim City, uh, an FBI agent, I want to say it was Blanchard. I could be wrong, but I think it might have been Blanchard. Anyway, uh, her identity was compromised as an informant by him and some of their internal communications that were not closely held. And so they had a legitimate fear that that information might have got out. And so they actually had to, um, they had to, 
prevent her from going back to Elohim City for out of fear for her safety. And then after the feds blow her cover, they arrest her. Right. So they go and they arrest her and her current boyfriend. And they try to take material that she had confiscated from Elohim City, which was uh, pieces of uh, grenades that she had Dennis Mahon on tape. He was taking these inert grenades and he was making bombs out of them. He was packing them with explosive material, basically making them active again. So she had this material that she was gathering for her ATF investigation. Well, the FBI, uh, well, they go and when they arrest her, they take this material and say that she had bomb making material. You know, of course, the irony is this is stuff she was gathering as part of a law enforcement investigation. And it was entirely, a, it, it was obviously politically motivated. They were doing this because she was a threat. She was a threat in some way. She was talking about things that the FBI didn't want people talking about. They didn't want to hear anything about John Doe 2. They didn't want to hear anything about other accomplices. They certainly didn't want to hear anything about uh, law enforcement being investigating these people in advance. They, they wanted to hear none of that. So the way they shut her up is by arresting her. And she got off on that. You know, she went to trial and all that. And, and she uh, uh, did not get into any trouble because, you know, she was not guilty. Um, she ultimately had to change her name, and she now is living under a different name. One interesting bit of trivia is, is that her um, her life story, was the rights to it, were purchased by um, Rom Emanuel's brother, which I thought that was weird. Rom Emanuel, this big time political and Democrat Democrat guy. His brother buys the rights to Carol Howe's story almost as it looks like a way to you buy this rights and then sit on it and never use it to make sure that no movie gets made about it. I thought that was interesting because it would I guess it would probably make the Clinton administration look really bad uh, because it all happened, you know, on his watch. But that's basically who Carol Howe is. She was right there. She knew some of the key people. Uh, she knew Andy Strassmeyer was talking about doing stuff, and that's whole, one whole reason they wanted to raid Elohim City and arrest Andy, uh, like we talked about on the Strassmeyer episode. One big reason for that is due to uh, what they had Carol Howe there investigating. I mean, they were already interested in Strassmeyer, but with Carol Howe, they got someone who was right there with him and who could be around him and you know, could, could collect evidence. All right. Uh, well, it sounds to me that she's a good example of foreknowledge and or involvement. Uh, one thing I missed were was she speaking out in any way or was this or was this the feds kind of getting on top of it before that was a possibility type thing? Yeah. So she wasn't speaking out. But what was happening is there was media figures who had found out who she was, okay. mostly J.D. Cash, and he was covering her story in the McCurtain Gazette. And so it was starting to get out in the media. Okay. So you got to control the optics, make her look like something exactly. different. Uh, I'm sure probably behind closed doors, they're like, hey, shut the fuck up. This will go away. Uh, you know, and obviously, yeah, I guess there's a story that got bought. Uh, so she's sitting pretty with a different name. And yeah, uh, okay. Well, that, that comes together now. Uh, where Who she was and what, uh, and another piece of the puzzle of, the many different aspects of how this isn't entirely what it seems. Absolutely. Um, and if people yeah. are interested, I have a transcript of an interview with her for one of the networks. I think it was ABC, maybe 2020, one of those programs, maybe it was 60 minutes. I don't recall, but I have a trans. There's a whole section on the Libertarian Institute for transcripts and it's not huge. You know, it's a small number of, of things. And so if you go there and browse it, you'll find it. And it's an interview with Carol Howe. And uh, there's a lot of material in the uh, news reports on Carol Howe. Her story is yet to really be told. I think there's a really good book there somewhere. And I think that she is probably out there and a good journalist could track her down and she might be even be willing to talk. And she's a person who hasn't told uh, the, whole, the whole thing. Um, the feds really wanted to prevent her from testifying at the, uh, the trials. And they did prevent her from testifying at one of them. Um, so, yeah. 
Those those transcripts you're speaking of, were those actually things that ended up getting airing, or were they just? Oh yeah. Okay, I don't know if there's interviews that never got used. It uh, aired. I wouldn't say that this was. I think this was after her arrest, and so she wasn't. It's not like she started speaking out. She was on 2020, and then they arrested her. It was after, I believe, after her arrest that she appeared on this 2020 okay. program. Well, so she was in the media for a little bit in like 96, 97. Um, she, I recommend anybody reading about Oklahoma City to read read up on her because she was a key witness. She was there. She saw it. She knew the people. And I don't, I don't think we've heard the last of Carol Howe. I think that one day we might hear more from her. Okay. Well, all right. I think that's probably a good spot to kill it. If you want to go ahead and drop your plugs again, we'll go ahead and get out of here. Absolutely. So people, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me there at uh, Booth, that's B-O-O-T-H underscore O-K-C. And on my Twitter profile, there will be a link there to my Medium page where I publish essays. Um, you also can find my essays in Garrison Magazine. And of course, go to libertarianinstitute.org slash O-K-C. You can find all of uh, my documents there. Yeah, and uh, with that, uh, this is the No Way Jose Show. You can find me on YouTube, all the major odd podcasters, Odyssey as well. Uh, I mean, considering the nature of what happened with this stream, if you really want to watch the intro, I'll, I'll probably have to manually upload it on Odyssey, so it'll probably be available there. I highly doubt Odyssey will pull that. Uh, but, yeah, otherwise, uh, the YouTube version is probably going to have that cut out because it'll probably just pull it all over again. Uh, but yeah, I also want to urge you once again, go check out that, uh, the Duncan Lemp episode I did with his, uh, his, uh, you know, girlfriend of the time is pre was pregnant at the time. Now his kid's like two years old. Uh, so yeah, go check that out. I think that was good. Uh, a lot of, for, you know, for one for the human side story of it. And then also on the other side, you know, if you're someone who follows a story, there's stuff in there that I haven't seen anywhere else cleared up some uh, confusion in some aspects of the story. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook. Uh, you know, that's probably the best place if you want to ensure that you can keep in contact with me, although I don't do much on there. So if you want to like follow me, you know, do, you know, interact like, or you know, post whatever, all I really do is drop promos. But, you know, if you do want to hit me up a messenger for whatever reason, you can hit me up there. Uh, but if you do want to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Senor Jose right now. That's who I am. Um, but, yeah, wait, is it Senor Jose? Yeah, Senor Jose 2020 uh, is what it is. Uh, and if you want to support me, patreon.com says no way Jose 2020. Uh, please uh, like, share, subscribe, uh, all that good stuff. Comment. Uh, you know, as you can tell from this ongoing series, a lot of it's been sh uh, shaped by you guys' interaction with us in the live streams or in the comments on social media. So if it's something that's uh, interesting that we forgot or or just say, you know, even if it's something that we didn't really feel like bringing up for whatever reason, if it's something uh, that's interesting or you guys are interested in, we'll, uh, we'll address it. Uh, we'll do as many episodes of these as we need to uh, till we cover, you know, feel like we cover everything that was really pertinent. But with that, we are out. Appreciate your time, Richard. We'll probably do this again you know, next week or something like that. We haven't scheduled it. But, uh, yeah, I hope to see you guys the live stream at the next one. I hope it doesn't get nuked. So <laughs> appreciate it.